of part two. It's actually part three of part two because I tried doing two broadcasts and it cut off. So I got about 20 minutes into it. So let's see what happens. Uh, those that end up joining live, um, I really pray that you pray for this because uh, this may be one of these tough studies that um, the saints would have a hard time with, the kingdoms of darkness would have a hard time with, because we're really going to get into what I believe to be essential teachings. So I'm praying, dear Father, please, Lord, let this study go through. Let this study go through. And I don't know if I should start and just leave this 20 minutes in, uh, from the last study and just go from there if I should just start all over again. So um, I'm going to ask those that are here, should I just start from the beginning? and uh, Or should I just um, pick up where I left off and just erase the first part? Because I'll go through it again. I don't mind. A lot of people don't understand how many times I have to go through studies. Sometimes it's been seven, eight times. And, uh, and it's, it is discouraging. If you're ever going to do ministry and it's discouraging, you get into it. I've gone well into an hour. It's dead. It's gone. That's it. And uh, so um, this, is, this is the nature of the beast. Okay? So um, let me know if you think I should just start um, where I left off or if I should start all over again. Just let me know. All right. Well, let's just go through the study. Let's see if I keep the first part. All the parallels in the scripture to today are all parallels around God judging his people before the siege. And the siege is what's called the abomination of desolation, where God allows unusual instruments that are usually under the power and the sway of Satan to really unleash hell's wrath upon God's people. In other words, Satan is loosed. Satan is loosed. And he releases them from the, quote, restraints that he'd once had and empowers the circumstances around us that we would normally call our enemy. God says, I want you as my people to relate to it as tools of your sanctification for the purposes of preparing you to meet me. And then you see in this Ezekiel 4, 9 picture of the bread and all the words that's used for the ingredients of the bread is really setting up a profile picture of Esau. It is red. It is hairy. It is rough. It is bearded. It's all this language that sounds very much like Elisha. Our sinful nature, our old man, right? And so this is John the Baptist. It's confession to our nature. We're confessing the sinfulness of our nature, and this is an essential before we come into the presence of God. This is absolutely essential that we relate rightly to things that God would not normally do. And he says, this is my work, my strange work, strange. But nothing else has worked. Speaking gentle, quietly, soft, tender, nurturing, affirming, validating, um, endlessly encouraging has only created a petri dish of wicked, sinful, pretentious, presumptuous, evil children that rebel against me day and night. So I'm going to have to hire somebody to beat you up on your way to school, uh, your enemy. And guess what? Your enemy is going to be on my payroll and going to bring you back to understanding the value of what it means to really be a part of this household. Not to be a trust fund child with all of your little billionaire excesses and your entitlement and the tyranny of your entitled mentality. Then, of course, we would say that's not us. We would never do this. So we don't know ourselves as well as God does, but we also don't understand the severity of what it means to be prepared to meet your God. God always has to start this process amongst his people 
And we are not to look at to what's happening on the outside because we won't be ready. It's just apparent that, well, things are going to look like they're going to kind of stir up, but then they're going to settle down. Yeah, Babylon might be getting their armies ready, but it, we're going to have a two year process and it's going to be a slap on the wrist and we're going to learn our little lesson. And but we're going to play our games again. And God says, no, this is like the big one. This is big league. So he he raises up a ton of prophets to warn God's people to relate to it in such a way that would benefit them because God does care about us and he cares about the outcome and he doesn't wish that any would be lost, that all would be saved, but he's not going to violate your free will, but he is going to bring in tools of sanctification that you did not prescribe God to do. In our pampered kind of entitled state, we would never prescribe for God to be allowing severity to come upon our backsides. But he loves us. He knows we're going to die in our presumption, our pretentiousness, our prescriptions we give God. And all the things that we use to insulate ourselves from really having the voice of God penetrate our lives. And so what God is going to do, and this is going to be a fascinating study, because, yeah, we're going to talk about Ezekiel bread. We're going to talk about the features in the bread. We're going to talk about the um, conditions in which Ezekiel was giving this prophecy. But also we're going to talk about his contemporary prophets that are all giving the same message, giving us a cross-reference as to what God is talking about regarding the take a clay tablet because a siege is coming. And it's going to do a work in you that if I were to tell you, you wouldn't believe it, but it's going to produce the fruits that I've been looking for that you didn't get it during peace and prosperity, but you're going to get it during trial and adversity, calamity. And the what's going to destroy us is that we can't relate to it. We cannot rightly relate to it. We only get in touch with our abandonment issues, our alienation, our victim mentality. And, of course, if we're ever slighted by God and he tells us anything, we're going to war because we're the petulant little children that we are. And God's warning us against that. He says, no, that's not the way to go. So this is essential that we hear the voice of God because don't look to the world. Please, please, in the name of Jesus Christ, don't look to the world as an indication as to where we are in the signs of the times. That's for the Gentiles, wicked nation. God's people need to be hearing the prophets, need to be hearing the thus saith the Lord. And what God is telling us that before it happens, that when it does happen, we might have a severe faith upon God. Because it's going to happen. So we're going to look here and we're going to go through Jeremiah. We're going to look at this process that's going to be essential for us. I understand this study is not going to be comfortable for anybody. And I would understand if people just check in and out because they can only take it in small doses. I got it. I got it. Most of us just are in the Christmas season. You know, we, we want our gingerbread cookies and our fudge. And, you know, what are we getting for Christmas? Well, this is going to be kind of intense. And I understand. If you want to come back after the first of the year and or, or, or maybe after the economy crashes or, or whatever you need to finally say, let me go back and, and look at those studies. Because they happened exactly as God was crying to us every time he's about to allow his people to be judged. He always has the same exact conditions amongst God's people, the same exact means in which he makes it happen, the same exact admonition and warning and reproof and the pleading of God's heart to God's people. And guess what we're going to see? Nah, meh, whatever. What, what's wrong with you, God? Get a heart. It's Christmas. God's like, man, my people just don't see it. They don't hear me. Go to Jeremiah. Um, I'm going to go through these verses again. I already spent 25 minutes of going through it on the previous study, but I'm going to go through this again. It doesn't hurt to get the repetition of it to those that were, the, were there uh, for the first study. That got cut off. Now it came to pass in the fourth year, Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying this, take a scroll, just like in Revelation chapter 10, just like in Ezekiel chapter two and three. It's this, it's this, you're going to taste of this experience. It's the idea of bread. You're going to experience this. I'm going to give you the bread of adversity. I'm going to give you the drink of tears of affliction, of trial, 
you're when he sends out mana, he's drawing them into an experience, into a journey, to an experiential journey. You want experience? It's not going to be this orgasmic kind of euphoric ecstasy experience. Don't let false prophets keep telling you that stuff. I don't care how much you love their stories, how much you love the teacher, how much they're being promoted on your favorite station. Listen to this. Just get a hold. This is all rich with the word of God. Very word of God-ish. Take the scroll of the book, write it, write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against the handwriting of, of ordinances are sins that God is recording. That's destroying us. That's hurting us. That's destroying our capacities, even to hear and appreciate what God is saying to us. Because we've created the most corrupt filter system that God can't even speak to us or we're mad at God. We need to change and twist everything. And then we need to create things in our own image and then tell God that he has to sanction it. Or else. He's not going to get the privilege of us having our little precious little twinkle toes in heaven. Poor God. That he can't have entitled, petulant, selfish, tender, delicate, and demanding children in heaven. How would God ever live without us? And against Judah and against all the nations. And from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day, how dare you talk to us? Israel separated from you. Judah's been cool. God says, you're the double whore. You're worse. You go out and you pay people to have sex with you. You're not even a paid harlot. You're worse than your sister. At least you got paid for 20 bucks. Oh, how dare you? How gauche? Oh my, oh my goodness. This cannot be from the Lord. Oh my, my sensibilities. My, my very precious, delicate sensibilities. God says, no, you're, woo, you're out there. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities in which maybe it may be that the house of Judah will hear harden not your heart what the spirit says to his people. Don't murmur. Don't just reject this out of hand. You're going to see that the king does and that the people in his court do the same thing. They refuse to hear this message. They dismiss it out of hand. Even worse than that which I purpose to bring upon them that everyone may turn from his evil way. Repent, John the Baptist. The confession, why do we believe only flattering things? Why don't we believe when God's telling us the truth about the sinfulness of our nature and the way in which we twist and edit everything? And we just flip everything that is really bad and we try to make it good. God saying, no, it's not going to work. God is truth. God lives in truth. I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. God loves us. He wants to forgive us. He wants us to lay a hold of what he's provided for us that we may have perfect standing before God. Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote on a school a scroll of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words that the Lord, which he had spoken to him. Well, so he's going to tell him, okay, I'm going to write a book. And then what you're going to see here, I'm just giving you an idea. They didn't believe it. They didn't want to believe it. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to believe such a thing. And God, again, during this type of process, when he's about to let the Babylonians in, the desolation that will be brought upon God's people as a cleanser, as a purifier, as a humbler, as tools of his sanctification. All the tools that God has is his sanctification. And he uses unorthodox and uncanny tools that are loathsome to our flesh, loathsome to our pride, loathsome to our fine sensibilities. He takes unorthodox, uncouth, and... Kind of ugly tools, like me. A lot of people say, David, there's a lot of great uh, truths that you teach. I just don't like the way you teach. I just can't watch. Well, that's that's you have to accept God's methods. So he instructs Baruch, right? You go, therefore, and read from the scroll, which you have written at my instruction, the words of the Lord in the hearing of the people in the Lord's house, on the day of fasting, the day of atonement. 
God's warning his people, pleading with his people. Harden not your heart. I'm about to judge my people. The house of God. Do you think this judgment is never going to happen? The day of atonement is never going to be executed? And you shall also read them in the hearing of all of Judah, the conservative party, those who stuck with God. Yeah, Rehoboam was a severe taskmaster, but we stuck it out with him. We we're not part of Jehoiada. I mean, um, a Jer- uh, Jeroboam, where he's the leftist liberal that's gone off into Egyptian idolatry. We're not like them. So Judah's like, what counsel do we need? We have the temple. We have the priesthood. They just had the, the revival of of Josiah before all of this. who comes from their cities. And it may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord and everyone will turn from his evil way. That is the naivete of the prophets. Of course, they're going to believe that they're going to hear, fear and obey, that they're going to hear and tremble and trust God and lay a hold of the hand of grace and mercy that God extends to all of us with nail pierced hands. Of course, of course that we're going to see the goodness of God. We're going to see the love of God poured out. And that we would turn from our wicked ways only because we've seen how much it hurts God. Of course we would, right? Of course we would. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against this people. Who? The Babylonians? No, us. Who use his name in vain. We want all the bennies of being called the children of God. We want to have the moral high ground of the people that could call themselves by the name of God. We want to back, have everything backed up with our, quote, hey, the Lord's on my side. But God says, but I have this against you. Verse 8 says, And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah the prophet commanded him, reading from the book of the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Where does judgment begin? And Jeremiah was known as the melancholy prophet. He wept. He was sad. God's heart beat through Jeremiah's heart. Weeping between the porch and the altar. Every prophet that shows up, we don't want to hear the voice. It's the voice of the violated bridegroom. It's the person who gets cheated upon and the cheater is indignant against the one who was the innocent party because they didn't want to be busted because you brought all the evidence. The bad guy is the person getting cheated on now. Yeah. How dare you shame the cheater? So he takes it to the quote house of Lord. But look what happens. Verse 18. Keep reading through this. So Baruch answered him answered them, said, he proclaimed with his mouth all these words to me. This is him bringing the actual book, and you're going to see what this book is here pretty soon. It's in the Bible. It's not a mysterious book. But it says that after they destroyed this book, a chapter was added. We're going to read that chapter. And I wrote them with ink in the book. Prophesy again. When God speaks to his people, it's the house of God, and it's the sins of God's people, and they completely don't want to hear it. Why? Because they assume that whatever correction God has is going to be a slap on the wrist. It's going to be minimal, but it's going to be business as usual. Tap, tap, tap. No more business as usual. No more business as usual. Not all things are going to keep going along as we prescribe God that they should all go along. No. No, God loves us and he knows us. And he has the tools of sanctification in his hands. He's got the meat hook. He's got the shovel. He's got the the snuffer. All the things that God uses to redirect and to reform and to correct his people to get them back on the way. And God in our, you guys, our wisdom is receiving But I'm here to tell you, it's going down. He's warned us. He's warned us. He's spoken to us. He's massaged our hearts. He has given us moments where, yes, we came to ourselves, but we've hardened and re-hardened and re-re-re-hardened. So, okay. So he can at least save eight. 
He can save a remnant. He can have at least his his bride ready for him. Narrow, straight, hard, few. Enter in. Just right now in hearing this, don't you just don't you want to be that? Don't you want to hear the words? Faithful servant, I'm well pleased. Enter into the kingdom that I've come to prepare for you. Did you know it's not going to be the majority of people that call themselves Christians are not going to be ascending in the clouds of glory? Have we not read the scripture warning us? Don't look to the left or to the right thinking, well, these people are fine because they're so godly. Don't listen. Don't look at that. Listen to what the spirit of God says to you. What you have to do to speak to God and to avail yourself of the atonement he has made for all of us. Verse 20 says, and they went to the king into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of the scribe, right? Elisha, of all people, Elisha. It's not Elisha, but it's, you know, they're bearing this name. And told all the words in the hearing of the king, and the king sent um, Jehuda to bring the scroll, and he took it from Elishama, the scribe's chamber, and Jehuda read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Harden not your heart. The spirit striving upon all men. Don't look to your friends. Don't look to your peers. Don't look to the to the trend or the atmosphere or the decorum or the vibe in the room. You let God speak to your heart. You let him individually get a hold of you. Be careful of groupthink. Won't save you in the end. In fact, you may die. You may end up in the lake of fire because of groupthink. Don't trust it. Verse 22 says, now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month. <coughs> okay, now we're past the, um, the seventh month. We've gone off into the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened that when Jehuda had read uh, three or four columns that the king cut it out with a scribe's knife, he pulled out a little pocket knife, cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. They burned it. They dismissed it out of hand, completely didn't take it serious at all. Just another negative thing. All this negativity during the holiday seasons. Here's the problem. Where is fear God? Give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come. Where's the fear and trembling? Where is the God let me not presume that I'm in a perfect state with you when you might want be trying to break through my, my protein shell protecting the cancer that's in my soul? Verse 24 says, yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments. And then we're looking around to see, well, I don't see my favorite teacher or preacher or pastor or my congregation. They're not in repentance. Why should I be? The king, nor any of his servants who heard all these words, don't look around. Don't look at your peers. Don't see who's going to go first. This whole Well, I'm not going to go first mentality. You better strike that from your mind. Do you care more about eternity or the goofballs around you who could care less? Nevertheless, and then we have some names here. I don't want to butcher it up, right? El Nathan, Delilah, uh, Jamara implored the king not to burn the scroll. There's at least a few people that weren't knuckleheads. There's always three, it seems like. But he would not listen to them. Why? Because he was too cool for school. This dude's happening, right? He doesn't need to hear repentance. He's all got, he's got his checklist. He's fine. So let's see what happens with that. Let's see how this plays out. Let's see if it's relevant for today. Now, after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, 
take yet another scroll, write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, had burned. You can't make it go away. You could pretend it all you want. You can't make it go away. You can say, la, 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 and you can't make it go away. You can say, I'm going to put my head in the sand and get caught up with things and get church busy, and it won't go away. Harden not your heart. What the Spirit says unto his people. Hear God for you, like these three people did. It's so over verse 29 says, and you shall say to Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, thus says the Lord, you have burned this scroll saying, why have you written it, written in it, that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and cause man and beast both to cease here. How dare you? We're the good guys. They're the bad guys. And the bad guys are always going to lose in every circumstance. No, they're not. Sometimes it's more important to save you and me out of our presumptions out of our assumptions and to allow the meanies to win, the dirty, rotten scoundrels to win. And for us to say, this is not fair. This is not fair. I'm better than them. All through the scripture, we do nothing but compare ourselves. God says, you better compare yourself to me. They're all going to be destroyed. I will destroy and judge the vessel that I use to sanctify you. Don't be a part of it. Don't be caught up. Don't be swept away when I judge them. Let it be for the tools of sanctification that I have designated for them. Let it inscribe itself upon your soul. Let it be a mictum. I've done studies about this where in the Psalms, God is really trying to tattoo something on us permanently. Everything so far has been pretty superficial. So don't reject when God puts an instrument in his hands, even though it's loathsome, be it Nebuchadnezzar, be it Cyrus, be it whomever and whatever. It's the king of Syria in the Old Testament. But whatever application you need to make it to today in which guaranteed that there's going to be an almost a resurgence, just like when the reforms came at the time of Josiah. And it almost happened. And then, boom, come the crashing down of God's people at the hand of Babylon. Babylon wins temporarily until Christ comes, until Cyrus comes and the kings of the East come, the literal return of Christ. But until then, there's an apparent trampling underfoot that happens to God's people. And if you're not prepared to relate to it rightly, you're going to move from despair to despondency and give up the shield of faith. And God says, do not give up the shield of faith. This is Jacob's time of trouble. This is a testing. This is a process of humiliation. God has got to displace whatever full strength that we have. It's ruining us, destroying us. We don't need confidence. We need weakness. Verse 32 says, because they didn't like that message. I don't want to hear that Babylon's going to take over. Babylon, this world, Babylon's going to take over for a period, guys. We're going to almost make it over the hill. Then we're going to slide all the way back, and it's going to be darker than ever. It's going to be a time of trouble such as never been since there was a nation. <clears throat> then Jeremiah took another scroll, gave it to Baruch the scribe, the son of Noriah who wrote on it the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the book, which they did destroy. Guess what? Here we go. Listen to this part, which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned with fire. And besides, there were added to them many similar words. This is the book of Lamentations. This is the weeping of God for his people because this is the point he had to bring them to for them to get it, get it through our coconuts, the walnut shell. The kind of, we have a very thick cranium and we don't get it. We think by pretending it away or being dismissive or having our little kind of bargaining, negotiating, negotiating narratives that we have with God that we see ourselves as so important. Hey, we're the apple of God's eye. Why would he do anything to me? And we look around starting comparing ourselves to the, ew, the Babylonians, ew, the Sumerians, 
Ew. Ew, at least we're not like Israel. At least we're not like the liberals. At least we're, oh my. God says, no, I have got to get down and polish a remnant that will receive reproof, unlike Laodicea, that will receive correction and discipline and polishing and humiliation. So I'm going to read from actually the Talmud, and it's going to talk about this process of when the temple was finally overtaken by the Babylonians. And I want you to see really kind of some of the historical perspective that's in this Talmudic writing. And I want you to get context of the flavor of what's going to go down, but on an epic scale. This is only in early history typology. This is only a, a foretaste. This is only a snack that you get at Costco as a taste test. You get only one ravioli. But wait till you get the entire dish served to you. <clears throat> and this is one of the uh, chief warriors of Nebuchadnezzar, right? <clears throat> when Nebuzaradan entered the temple, he found the blood of Zechariah seething, bubbling. This was the blood that Christ talked about that remained between the porch and the altar that testified against God's people in their hard-heartedness against the warnings of the prophets to turn to God. And all you got to do is read the book of Zechariah. And Zechariah is sitting there giving them all these great illustrations, all these picture language, and they didn't want to hear it. Nothing new with God's people, even today. So, because it's negative. And it's not validating and accepting. It's not affirming. So they saw Zachariah's blood that they could never scrub out. They were trying to scrub out their, their, their shame of their sins of killing the prophet. Stayed. They couldn't get out. And so what's interesting is they wrote it here. It says, so he asked the Jews, the general uh, that's in the Babylonian army, thinking, this is weird. Why is that bud, that blood bubbling there? He asked the Jews what this phenomenon meant. They attempted to conceal the scandal. We don't want to tell you because they knew. They knew that the blood of Zechariah was like the blood of Abel. That we're always killing the true admonition to turn towards the whole burnt offering of the infinite righteousness provided by the three persons of the Godhead. We don't want to hear about alien righteousness because the war of Satan is the same war we have in our hearts against God. We want God to look how beautiful and wonderful and amazing and enchanting and we are bedazzled by ourselves. And God says, don't look to yourselves. Trust me, that's not your source that you're going to refer to on the day in which I will justify you. You'll be justified by turning towards me and letting me provide for you what you couldn't provide for yourself. They attempted to conceal the scandal, but he threatened to comb their flesh with iron combs. Whoa, he was going to skin them alive. They said, oh, oh, you mean that blood, that seething, bubbling blood? Oh, oh, that's what you mean. So they told him the truth. There was a prophet among us who chastised us, spanked us, gave us reproof, gave us discipline, corrected us, told us things we didn't want to hear. And it was Christmas time, and we, I was in the middle of drinking my peppermint hot chocolate. And I had my little cozy foot warmers on. And we killed him. And I'm sure Nabu um, Zaradan was like, that's not, a, that's not really a good idea. He was warning you against this? For many years now, his blood has not rested, just like Abel's blood. How we love to just kill the voice of God when he tells us things that we don't want to hear because we're in a drunken stupor. So Nebuzaradan said, well, I'll appease him. I will avenge that blood. And then he killed the members of the great and the small Sanhedrins. Whoa, this is in the Talmud they wrote this. This was a horror show. 
And then he killed the youths and the maidens and then school children. Altogether, he killed 940,000 people. Almost a cool mill. Still, the blood continued to boil, whereupon Nebuzaradan cried, Zechariah, Zechariah, I've slain the best of them. Do what do what you want, all of them to be destroyed. And then it says at last the blood sank into the ground. And just from there left a stain. Now I wasn't there. This is fascinating. Because what you're going to see here is that this scroll that Jeremiah wrote was the book Lamentations, saying they are going to kill old and young and even the good ones. It's going to not be anything you've ever seen before. The wicked and the innocent will perish together. Not only the good ones live, many will die. If you want to pray to be a part of the 144,000, you might see some of your fellow saints who will be resurrected on that day be slaughtered too. Why would God save you? But you're going to be seeing a horror show that they were spared of. Just in this little tiny little forgotten blip in history, it says in addition to the 940 thousand people killed in the after aforementioned incident millions more were killed inside and outside the city many thousands of the people that had escaped the sword were taken prisoner and led uh, into captivity in babylon where some of their best had already preceded them daniel and his three friends only the poorest of the residents of jerusalem were permitted to stay on to plant the vineyards and to work the fields this is all through jeremiah so remember, he read to them lamentations. He was already weeping for them, and they didn't see reason to weep. So he says, but I've also added more to it, and that's chapter 5 of Lamentations. Let me read it to you, because if we don't want to hear what God says, he will add more. If we want to challenge God and say, you're not allowed to do that, he will add more. But adding more, he's not just adding more bad stuff. It's a deeper pleading with us. Chapter 5 is where he pleads deeper to his people. Asking us, pleading with us, petitioning to us, adjuring us, begging us, don't harden your hearts. Lamentations 5. Remember, verse 1, O Lord, what has come upon us? Look and behold our reproach, anna, affliction, atonement, humility. Our inheritance has been turned over to aliens. We've been overrun. Our borders are destroyed. There is insurrection everywhere. There is sabotage and ruin and the fall of our institutions. And our houses to foreigners. Please listen to this. We've become orphans and waifs. Our mothers are like widows. We pay for the water we drink. And our wood comes at a price. Even our heating and everything else. It's not like it used to be. We've been taken over. They pursue us at our heels. We labor and we have no rest. We have given our hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians, foreigners on all sides. We've collapsed to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are no more, but we bear their iniquities. It's not even about what you did. It's going to be about the fact that we're all going down. We're all going down because of it. We have collectively built up our stink pile, our rotting sins. All the prophets, all of the children of God have always confessed their sins, but also the sins of the fathers.
Servants rule over us. There is none to deliver us from their hand. People that literally, they're not high quality people that are going to rule over you. They're just not going to be high quality. Everything's inverted. <sighs> Famine in the land. We get our bread at the risk of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Things are going to change. I'm just telling you before they happen so that when they do happen, you may not lose your shield of faith in Christ. Our skin is as hot as an oven because of the fever of the famine. They've ravaged the women amongst God's people in Zion. The maidens in the cities of Judah. These beautiful, precious souls that we've done everything to help them to be as godly as possible. Princes were hung up by their hands and the elders were not even respected. That's the extra chapter that he wrote because we won't hear it. Young men ground up at the millstones, boys staggering under loads of wood, little nine-year-old slaves being harassed and harangued by soldiers. Not my boy! The elders have ceased gathering at the gate. No more meetings, no more prayer meetings. What are the elders going to do? But my pastor, your pastor... And the young men from their music. No more worship songs out in the hills? The joy of our heart has ceased and our dance has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us. Your house is left unto you desolate. You wouldn't hear. For we have sinned because of this. Our heart is faint. Because of these things, our eyes grow dim. God seems even further away. And because of Mount Zion, which is desolate, the abomination that causes this desolation, and we're sent out to a wilderness journey, oppressed and repressed and pursued and persecuted with foxes. You know what the word foxes are? It's interesting because even you'll see here in Luke chapter 13, Christ refers to Herod as a fox. These are people that are just digging holes and everything. The word fox means to dig a hole. Nothing but holes. Nothing but traps. Nothing, every, the, the, the foxes spoil the vine. Every time you turn towards something, it's not there. The fox has ruined it. They've craftily set everything up as a trap. They've taken away every resource that you thought you could go to. But 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 I'm a prepper. I'm a survivalist. I, I, I have a, a storage trailer somewhere that has dried food, guns, and, and purifiers and water. Well, the foxes have gotten it. With foxes walking about on it, you, O Lord, remain forever. You're thrown from generation to generation. Why do you forget us forever and forsake us for so long a time? Eli. We're going to go through our own judgment at the house of God. Eli, lama sabatani. Nevertheless, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That's your only model through this. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and are very angry with us. God says, it's for mercy's sake. Why didn't you listen to the words of my servants, the prophets? The fox idea. Luke 13, 31 to 33 says, on that very day, some Pharisees came saying to him, hey, listen, we're going to give you some good intel. Get out and depart from here for Herod wants to kill you. This is a dangerous place to be, Jesus. And he said to him, go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform, uh, perform cures today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I shall be perfected. In other words, I'm going to do what, I'm called to do and let him do what he's going to do. I'm not afraid. 
Verse 33 says, nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the following day, for it cannot be that a prophet shall perish outside of Jerusalem. Christ knew that he was setting himself up to go, he go to ram war with Satan. So God, again, warns his people and says, red beans, lentils, barley. And we're going to get into this whole loaf of bread that he prescribes for God's people saying, in other words, you're going to have to become like Esau. You're going to have to become like Cain. You're going to have to confess the sinfulness of your nature, and you're going to have to see yourselves as the hairy garment wearing man, the one who's cast outside the gate to the city that you are crying out as a voice in the wilderness, as one who is in need of repentance. That's what that imagery is for. We're supposed to identify ourselves as Cain, ironically, as Esau. That's what the prophets were doing. They were beating their breasts, calling the sinfulness of their nature that it's animal-like, like Nebuchadnezzar did when he went crazy for seven years and was outside the gates of the city until he looked up and his mind was restored to him. They are a model of repentance, of confession of nature, that we're rapacious, that we are lustful, that we are without love and justice and and the true contentment that God has called us to have, to trust him. No, we're competing with everybody else. We are, we are like wild animals. We don't hear God. And the last people to hear this is why I'm going to go to Malachi chapter 1. The last people that want to hear this are those that are serving at the temple. You want to excite the wrath of the establishment with satanic wrath? Expose the serpents at the temple. Expose the brood of vipers that are coursing their way through the temple, using the name of God in vain, turning it into a very den of thieves, masquerading as very, like Satan did, angel of light, minister of righteousness, sanctimonious, wrapping yourselves up in your Holier than thou robes. God's warned us all through scriptures not to do that. He's warned us time and time again not to play the whole sanctimonious game. But we play it and we say, who us? But I have a position in the church. I'm a priest. I'm a scribe. I'm an administrator. I'm a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I'm a whatever. I'm a whatever, but I'm immune from these things. God, how dare you indict me? Okay. Well, what happens here, the last people that God warns before he shows up with a, quote, Elisha-type person, John the Baptist, an Esau-sounding person who's described by the very diet of this bread of Ezekiel 4.9, of this Cain wandering as a beast in the wilderness, John the Baptist shows up. But prior to that is a 400-year silence, exactly mimicking the 400-year silence in which the children of Israel were in Egypt It was time to deliver them, and he sends in Joseph as an agitator, as an agitant, as a a burning stick in the fire, as a firebrand to stir up the pot to begin the process of delivering God's people and judging their enemies. So who does God speak to giving a last message before he goes on radio silence for 400 years? The priests, the people at the temple those that are professional clergy that are closer to the Shekinah glory and they don't see the danger they're in. When Christ came, who did he admonish? Who did he confront? That class of people. When Ezekiel confronted a class of people, who was he confronting? The same class of people. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Zechariah, all of them confronted the temple leadership. And that's who went to war with the word of God. Do you see the irony? And don't you see that that's the way it is now, but we can't see it because we think, no, they're too godly. They're better than those people. That's what they thought back then. We can't see it. We've normalized some pretty crazy stuff. We've gone way off course. Where's the humility? So what does he do? He likens the priest to Esau. 
to the hairy man with the garment, to the hairy bearded man who's out in the wilderness. They're like, who, us? We're more like Jacob. No, you're more like Esau. You don't love the birthright. You're playing games. You like the goodies, like Cain did. Oh, our sensibilities, we're so wounded. I just got unfriended by a pastor yesterday. Not because I attacked him personally, I didn't. I just told him to be careful that he doesn't teach what's called quietism. Because he's he literally says that at the end of time, the 144,000 are going to be 144,000 light bulbs, just shining beautiful sanctimonious lights. The prism and the mosaic of God in beauty shine. And I said, I mean, do you literally believe that? Like, literally. It's like, yes. I said, brother, that's that's called quietism. That that's genuinely heresy. No, God puts his people through a polishing. All the circumstances that God brings his people under are under great affliction and trial and pressure. They only shine under suffering because they retaliate not, but they turn towards God. It's not this let go, let God, this kind of bizarre Hindu kind of transcendentalism. Swept away in feelings. So anyway, Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 6, verse 12 says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals or the foxes, that's the same word, of the wilderness. Even though Edom, which is the word for that diet of the Ezekiel 4-9 bread, it's describing Esau as Edom is red and hairy and rough and thick and all this type of thing. We have been impoverished. Even though Edom says we've been impoverished, but we will re return and build the desolate places. This is so key you understand this here. Why does God bring about the desolation? The abomination that brings about the desolation because he says, don't go back and rebuild. I've destroyed that for a purpose. It's for your sake. I've destroyed your idols. I've destroyed the things that have made you important and self-sufficient. I've destroyed the things that have validated things that are sin in my eyes, but you have been proud of those things. You have presented those things as if these are enviable things, and it's only memorials of your harlotry. Don't go back and rebuild what I've torn down. And they say, but you impoverished us, but we will return and build back the desolate places. And that's the whole language in the Hebrew of the little horn power. The idea of little, the word little, that's in Hebrew, the book of Daniel says it's a retaliatorial spirit. It's a Napoleonic complex it says, oh, yeah, well, I'll show you. That's what, why it's called a stout horn. It's something that fights back. It says, oh, yeah, I'll be more persistent. Oh, yeah, you're going to push me down. I'm going to push harder. I'm the he goat, and I will get my way. So you want to know if you really are of that, quote, Esau nature, hairy, red, thick, bearded, petulant, tut rough, earthy, Edomite, where you get Adam, red soil. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. You're going to war with the wrong God. They shall be called the territory of wickedness, and they will be cast out and vomited out of the land. That's Laodicea. They're going to fight God because they love their self-sufficiency, and everything they build is a memorial of their sufficiency. They don't accept the lot that God has designated for them in putting them into a place of humility, of nakedness, of confession, of trust of God. And the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. You're going to war with God. And he's ta talking to the priest class that's saying, what have we done wrong? What do you mean we've done something wrong? We're the good guys. We're pastors. We're teachers. We teach at the seminar. We teach in universities. We have podcasts. We have we have television shows. We're on the Hope Channel, three ABN, and it is written. And what? What? what, 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 what wait a minute. We're the good guys. 
We're on Praise the Lord and whatever other channels you could think of. God TV. Your eyes shall see and you shall say the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. In other words, guess what? God rules everything, and that even means your enemies. And if he wants to use your enemies as a rod of chastisement, you better recognize it's the hand of the Lord and come under the Lord's discipline. The Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. It even says throughout Scripture that people that aren't even of God is going to wag their head and pass by and say, why would they fight their God? Even us pagans don't do that. Verse 6 says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I'm the father, where is my honor? Fear God. Give glory to him. Don't you want to be registered in the house of God? Don't you want to be a son and daughter of God? Don't you want to be a child of the living king? Don't you want your name written in the land's book of life in the registry of heaven? Where's our? Where do we honor him and his decisions and whatever he designates for us? Whatever prescriptions he gives for us, why are we burning them in the fire, then handing him our, our Christmas list, our laundry list, our prescriptions for the drugs that we want? We're Elvis Presley telling the colonel to go back and give us some more drugs, some more, some more opiates, baby. Bloated, inebriated. Living in a fantasy, thinking we're superstars. Well, guess what? Elvis has left the building. And if I am a master, where is my reference? Use my name, use my credit card, but you have no respect for me. We're just a bunch of billionaire trust fund children, and we're walking around like nothing's wrong. Says the Lord of hosts. To you priests who despise my name, and yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? We just don't see, do we? You know why? Because we do that which is right in our own eyes. Because God is judging from the perspective of his throne. Of what will condemn us, what would destroy us, what's an abomination before God. Not you, not me, not what the church decides, not what some committee decides. What God decides, God knows what's an abomination before him. We could get together with our committees and our meetings and our constituents and the quorums or whatever we put together and we could vote away, but it's before the eyes of God. We don't sanction anything. What way we despise your name? What? Verse 12 says, but you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit is contemptible. In other words, what God gives you as your spiritual diet, a life of trust and humility, you don't go and say, I'm going to go and do this and go do this. When God tears it down, you keep it tore down. You don't go back to it. If he tears down Jericho, leave Jericho alone. If he tears down some idol in your life, leave it tore down. Why are we endlessly testing God and then saying that we trust and love God, but we don't care what pains the heart of God? So Ezekiel 4, let's go back to 9. You also, son of man, take a clay tablet, lay it before you, portray on it a city, Jerusalem, lay siege to it, build a siege wall against it, and heap up a mound against it, do everything you can. Go ahead. God says, I dare you to fight against me. Go right ahead. Do everything you can to resist this. Let's see how it plays out for you. You're at war with God. Set camps also against it and place battering rams against all around. And moreover, take for yourself an iron plate and set it as an iron wall between you and the city. Set your face against it and it shall be besieged and you shall lay siege against it. And this will be a sign to the house of Israel. When God lets all this go down, it will be a sign to us that what he said was so. And he's trying to get down to our heart because we have pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency. And it will destroy us upon the judgment. We need to be, quote, brought through the affliction. So he says, lie on your left side, the iniquity of the house of Israel. 
So you have your left side. <laughs> you can even look at this as leftists if you want. Marxists, liberals, progressives, process the theology, open theism. Whatever goes, whatever we decide, whatever we validate. Then according to the number of the days that you lie upon it, you're going to bear their iniquity. God is the one that has to bear the iniquity of our sins. And it's God laying on his side naked as the second Adam. Looking to give birth by blood and water to his whorish bride. For I have laid on you the years of their iniquity according to the numbers of the days. All the prophet was was a manifest display of what God is going through. So we can finally get it into our heads. Oh, is this a picture of what God goes through? Yeah, it's right in front of you in technicolor, in living person, being played out. This is absolutely performance art for you guys. God is the naked one. He's the one eating the poop smoke bread that we offer him that's our lives 390 days and you shall bear the iniquity of the house of israel and when you have completed them hey lie on your right side what us conservatives we have less sin yeah bear the iniquity of the house for 40 days yeah we okay maybe we've done maybe the conservatives have done less thing wrong but they're the double harlot they're the protectors of the Shekinah, of the Ten Commandments, of the mercy seat, of the judgment of the house of God. What are we doing thinking we could compare ourselves to Israel, to the liberals, to the leftists? I've laid on you a day for uh, each for a year. That's all language of Leviticus chapter 25, if you don't know it. All this is based upon we have become idolaters. We have chased after another husband. We have hoarded ourselves um, uh, to others we have chased after because we didn't want God anymore. We only wanted the things of God. We didn't want actually God. And so God's allowed us to go into the bondage of our lover's house. We get to stay there. If you've seen Slumdog Millionaire and the girl that's kind of taken over by this gangster, then this kid goes on this game show to, to win her love back. Well, that's the picture. That's the story of redemption. But we chased money. We've chased our security. We've chased in our harlotry other lovers, and now we're imprisoned. And now it's not so easy to get out, is it? Therefore, you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem. Your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. And surely I will restrain you so that you cannot turn from one side to the other till you have ended the days of your siege. You're going to go through it, America. Protestantism had a safe refuge here. We were a moral voice to the world. In World War II, as recently as that, we could have taken over the world. We're the only ones that had nuclear power. We didn't. We went back to our homes. And what did we do? Hopefully, this is what the idea was. We're going to rebuild the rest of the world and say, let's just do it right. But no. And then came the intrigue. Then came the political conniving and maneuvering and manipulation. Then we started the surveillance state. Then we started sending out the CIA. And then we started playing these, these international games to create a, quote, a new world order, a liberal democracy that's global. And now here we are. We're just like the Babylon whore herself in the medieval ages, doing nothing different than what papal Rome did in the Justinian Code, looking to seize the world as if they're going to bring the kingdom of God upon this world in their very dark and very malicious ways. Now we became an image to that. The United States of America. And now we're seeing the fruits of that. I challenge anyone to challenge me on the theology of this. I would love to take time, not to prove anyone wrong, but to win you over to understanding what's going on. It's going to go down. This was the birthplace of missionaries all over the world for the gospel. After World War I, the gospel went to the entire world, the Protestant gospel, justification by faith. 
alien righteousness, substitutionary righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. That went to the world after World War I. And then comes World War II. The attempt to globalize and to come under a one world idea. And then we resisted those urges as we were poised to do that. Now, here we are after 9-11. Don't think that third time around, we haven't decided to totally whore ourselves over. And there's no turning back now. Look at what's happening around you. Go ahead, set up the siege walls. Resist it. Verse 9 says, also take for yourself wheat, barley, beans, lentils, millet, spelt. Last study, we've gone over each, look up, do the word study. It's literally... These ingredients are describing what John the Baptist looked like, what Elijah looked like, what Esau looked like, the picture of Cain wandering through the wilderness and put them into one vessel and make bread of them for yourself. God is prescribing for us a life of humility, of scarcity. Ironically, that will be our nourishment. Ironically, that will be what saves us. God stripping us of our decadence. God stripping us of our opulence. God stripping us of our extravagance. We don't need to be the harlot anymore. We don't need to be dripping and bejeweled and bedazzled by ourselves. We don't need to be drunk on our power anymore as a nation, as a church, or as a person. During the number of days that you lie on your side, 390 days, you shall eat of it. In other words, we're going to have to eat humble pie. You don't understand the spiritual meaning of this. All we seem to get is, look, the year-day principle interpreting Bible prophecy and a good, healthy diet for the end of time. There's much more to glean from this. There's much more to suck the marrow out to understand that God's going to bring his people through judgment. They're going to be brought into the Elijah message. They're going to be living the John the Baptist message. We're going to be literally cast outside the gate into the city. We're going to be judged and punished because of all the nations in the world. United States was the haven for Christianity and Protestantism and the free exercise of religion and of a free conscience. And it's over now. It's over. Verse 11. You shall also drink water by measure. One sixth a hen from time to time you shall drink. You're going to be rationed. You're going to be like Elisha in the brook and the raven. This is going to be the drying out spell before the rains come. Yes, there will be a rain. Yes, but there is a severe drying out. There's going to be the besieging. There's going to be the Babylonian uh, picture that's coming in which we're going to not be able to prevail against what God is designating for his people. In, In an apparent safe land, in an apparent safe haven, that's over. But God says, go ahead, fight it. You shall eat it as barley cakes and bake it using fuel of human waste in their sight. You're going to smell your own exhaust. You're going to smell your own nature in it. You're going to meet yourself in the way that dressing in the hairy garment is supposed to have its effect upon you. You're supposed to know your nature and not see yourselves as this mystical being. As this beautiful peacock that is so immune from everything listening to fantastical narratives in which we are these enchanted, amazing things. And that's always been the condemnation that God's had, that God has had against his people. They deck themselves up in jewelry. They wear fine clothes. They seek the Babylonian garment. They parade around and they think nothing touches me because I'm so amazing and beautiful and y'all have to admire me. I sit in the best seats of the house and I'm praised in the marketplaces and everyone thinks I'm wonderful. Look at me, look at me, look at me. So he says, you're going you're gonna to eat this with the smell of your own dung in it. You're going to see that you're not hot stuff. And this is for your sake. This is to help you to kind of get grounded again, to come back home. The prodigal son's got to come home. He's got to eat the, 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 the pig uh, corn husks. And you've got to get down to the pig sometimes to really come home, to really repent, to really make your way back to the father's house. To really be wearing the robes of Christ's righteousness, to really to be given the signet ring, to really to be back established with God again. That's God's prescription for repentance. 
that everything is cooked in your own dung, you're going to see that you're the Christ killer. You're going to see that Christ has entrusted his life to you, and we crucified him. And we're going to say, what have I done? I have betrayed the innocent one. Be baptized. Receive the same reproach that Christ received. Enter into a baptism of identity with him. Not your own bizarre, twisted narratives of what identity is, and your identity politics, and your socializing constructs of, it's a social construct, identity, garbage, and the church participating in that stuff. Then the Lord said, verse 13, so shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles where I drive them. God is going to remove our diadem. He's going to take off our little our little trinketry garments, the way that we fashion them according to our customizing of everything has to be beautiful and perfect and wonderful and just for me. So I said, ah, oh, Lord God, indeed, I have never defiled myself from my youth until now. I have never eaten what died of itself or was torn by beasts, nor was abominable flesh has ever come into my mouth. And you see, we use these little tiny things that we use as our monikers to say, what? I'm fine. I'm doing good. I go to church every Sabbath. I participate in potluck. I help clean up. I participate in the evangelism programs. I work in cradle roll. I'm on uh, the nominating committee. You see, we, we, we find these little externals to say, well, I've never done these things. Why would I have to go through this? Or he said to me, son of man, I will surely cut off the supply of the bread in Jerusalem. They shall eat bread by weight and with anxiety. Designated of God for our sake. All things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his show bread. That's the word purpose. Prothesis, prothestomy. And shall drink water by measure and with dread and fear and trembling and trust and anything that can be shaken will be shaken. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, that you've taken the steering wheel because I'm steering myself right off the cliff into a fantastic world of Thelma Louise off into the Grand Canyon holding hands as a couple of lesbians just shooting off into our rainbow destiny to destruction. That they may lack bread and water and be dismayed with one another. We're too busy parading in front of one another, impressing one another, performing in front of one another. What are we doing in looking to the left and to the right, comparing ourselves to one another? That's not how you find righteousness. Don't be glad at someone else's downfall thinking, well, that means that I'm righteous. That's not the measuring rod of righteousness. They waste away because of their iniquity. So I'm going to just, let's see, we're an hour, 13 minutes into it. I'll just keep going until, you know, we'll just do a part three on this. I'll just kind of go for a little bit. So Jeremiah is warning God's people. You see, it's this whole 30 pieces of silver thing and everything else. We think, well, let's take a look here. Is it, If God disappoints my expectations, shouldn't I just sell him out? He's wounded me. He's gored me. He's hurt me. He's wounded my precious little heart. Why should he not be sold out as a dangerous ox? Why shouldn't I be compensated? Why shouldn't I compensate myself when God wounds me? How dare God put a wound on me? Be careful of the internal dialogue. Jeremiah 19, 1 to 4, 8, 9 says, Thus says the Lord, go and get a potter's earthen flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests. In the church leadership class of people, and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnon, a picture of when God destroys his enemies in the lake of fire at the second resurrection, which is at the entry of the potsherd gate. That is the picture of where Lot, I mean, excuse me, where um, Job was. It's where Judas was buried. It's the field of broken vessels that the no-names go and die. There's a point of meditation. To see your end, to see, is it really worth the rebellion against God? And proclaim there the words that I will tell you and say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, the very religious people, Judah and Jerusalem. 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring such a catastrophe upon this place that be that whoever hears it, his ears will tingle. Anyone's ears tingling yet? Anyone really having the Holy Spirit penetrate your heart and getting down into the soft, gooey center? Anyone else unable to resist the voice of God speaking to us and saying, I can't presume anymore. I cannot distrust God and trust my own narratives anymore. I cannot self-soothe and self-comfort with presumption and popular narratives anymore. Anybody feeling that way? Because they have forsaken me and made this place an alien place. I wonder why we're having the experiences through the immigration crisis. Because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known and have filled this place with the blood of the innocents. Whoa. We just think because it's peacetime, because we're not receiving the direct wrath of God and the displeasure of God, that we can just go on in our sins. This is a serious intervention. I will make this city desolate, the abomination that causes desolation, and a hissing. What's the hissing? Everyone who passes by will be astonished and hiss because of all of its plagues. Who are the people? The people that said, well, that's not my God. Why would they disobey their God? Didn't they have the living God? And I will cause them to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters. And everyone shall eat the flesh of his friend in the siege, in the desperation with which their enemies and those who seek their lives shall drive them to despair. Yeah, I'm telling you exactly what Jeremiah has been saying. And this is going to happen to God's people. This is what's going to prepare God's people for the return of Christ. We're going to have to be wearing Elijah's clothes. John the Baptist clothes. We're going to have to be saying repentance, repentance, repentance. We're going to have to see ourselves as wandering animals of the wilderness. We are Esau. We are Cain. And this, and the blood of our brothers cries out against us. First John tells you these things. Where's the Holy Spirit now penetrating our hard hearts Always saying, that doesn't apply to me. What if it does apply to you and me? What if we are Cain? What if we are Esau? What if we're Edom? When do we confess the sinfulness of our nature? When do we realize that we call ourselves God people, but when God shows up, we reject him. We abandon him. We try to put him in prison, and, and then when we get our hands on him, we kill him. We murder him. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And yet we walk around sanctimonious with our, quote, counsel in the synagogue nonsense that we play. And after Christ died, everything went back to normal, except for those who trusted Christ. They had to lamb it. But everything else in Jerusalem was all hunky-dory until the siege came. Isaiah, even Isaiah, 100 years prior to this, was giving the first warnings. And then Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah was all reading from Isaiah saying, is this really going to happen to God's people? Verse 3 through 6 of Isaiah 29, then 9 through 16, et cetera, says, I will encamp against you all around, and I will lay siege against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you. Who? Us. God's people. Your house is less left, left unto you desolate. Why? Because you don't want to hear the voice of God. They sawed Isaiah in two. They put him in a log and they cut him in half. They don't want to hear it. The church doesn't want to hear it. Those that call themselves by God's name don't want to hear it. We want to hear smooth things. We want to hear things that appease us. Things that are fit according to our expectations. So they're not offensive. How dare we ever be offensive, right? Listen, God is not offensive for offensive sake. 
He's offensive because we have cloaked ourselves with narratives of self-enchanted, deceptive lies. And our sins are offended. You shall be brought down. Why? Because we're up. We're high. We see ourselves in these haughty places. You shall speak out from the ground. Why? Because God has got to bring the glory of man where? Where does God got to lay the glory of man in order for us to lay a hold of substitutionary, alien, infinite, eternal righteousness that is outside of us? Where does God have to lay the glory of man? It's in his mercy that he deconstructs our high glory, our fancy glory, our well-decorated glory, our refined glory. Your speech shall be brought low out of the dust, and your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall be a whisper out of the dust. Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust. And the multitude of the terrible ones like chaff that passes away. And yes, it shall be in an instant suddenly. Peace and safety suddenly. Peace and safety. Sudden destruction. False teachers, false prophets minimizing. God's only got to kind of correct our course a little bit. Suddenly. The thief suddenly comes to the house. The killer suddenly shows up in the hallway, taking an ancient face from the gallery and walk on down the hall. And he came to a room and he looked inside. Suddenly. And you shall be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise. Do you see that in the book of Revelation when it says thunder, earthquakes and great noise? It's talking about when the when the uh, when the coals <clears throat> on the pan they take they take it at some point uh, from the Day of Atonement and they take the coals from the altar of incense and they put it on a pan and then when they remove the veil they throw it to the ground and it's the time of great trial great trouble a time of trouble such as never been when you hear the crashing of that sound the prayers of the saints go up and creates a veil pleading with God. It is a sound of thunder and earthquake and great noise with storm and tempest and the flame of a devouring fire. Absolutely paralleling what happens when those coals are cast down to the ground in the sanctuary. It's a great time of trouble, of great prayer and humility from where? From the dust of the ground. From a great place of great crying out where our glory is brought down. We, we are reminded that we are made of dust. Right now, we think we're made of fairy stardust or something. That we're all David Bowie and Freddie Mercury. Pause and wonder, Isaiah says. Bind yourselves, excuse me, blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely who? The prophets, the teachers, telling you the peace and safety, the smooth things, the soft things. And he has covered your heads, namely the seers. All the people telling us the narratives that really are fitting our expectations. Do what's interesting is if you really want to reflect the full glory of God, if you really want to behold and be changed into the full glory of God within our sphere, we li are limited in our sphere because of our sinful nature, but there is still the ability to reflect God in our sphere in the spectrum in which can be expressed of God. Did you know in order to really display the love of God, you have to not have choice little scriptures that you go to, that you should read the whole counsel of God, because from Genesis to Revelation, the entire thing is an expression of God's love, including what we're talking about here. Did you know that everything I'm describing right now is all God's love? You want to be the display of God's love? It's certainly not these little 
sugary candy, saccharine sweet weirdness. That's like a devil. That's a flatterer. That's a harlot. That's the seductress. That's not true love. Somebody who loves you will warn you and plead with you and be here at 140 in the morning when my family is down visiting their family for Christmas. But I want to stay here doing videos to admonish saints that are probably going to, going to go into a period of dark depression because of the circumstances that are coming upon the world right now. And I want to be here pleading with you in the middle of the night. The reason I can even speak as strong as I am, because everyone's gone. Everyone is off with their families. Everyone is unwrapping presents. Everyone's having dinner and they're sitting around the fireplace and they're talking about the wonderful past and everything else. No, I would rather warn God's people and don't tell me this is not love. This is love. Love has this, this spectrum to it or why is the scripture so filled with it? All of a sudden, God's not a loving God because he tells you things you don't want to hear. Love sacrifices. Love has the courage to tell you the truth, even though you're going to get offended. But in the end, you will see that the people that flattered you and told you what you wanted to hear didn't love you. The whole vision has become to you like words of a book that is sealed, sealed against you. You can't hear. The Pharisees couldn't hear Christ. They couldn't understand the parables. They are you talking about us? How dare you? Sealed are people that hear God. Sealed are people that hear his voice and hear his admonition and his instruction, correction, reproof, et cetera, et cetera. They receive the rod of God. They come under the wings of God, under the fold of God, under the sanctuary of God, under the hem of his garment which men deliver to one who is illiterate saying, read this, please. And then he says, I cannot for it is sealed because people don't have ears to hear. They don't want to hear what the spirit says. They don't want to hear the correction or the reproof. They want to be just lulled into a flattery to their own doom. And then they're going to wake up. It says a spirit of slumber, of sleep, of deep narcoleptic, deep, deep sleep. A slumber is going to come upon God's people and they're going to wake up at a second resurrection outside of Jasper walls. And then they'll be stark raving sober. And their whole life will be as a weird dream going, what happened there? And then they wake up. But the gospel is to wake you up now. The gospel is to alert the sleeping bride. It's high time that we do awake and hear it before the doom comes, the destruction comes, before we wake up a thousand years later than those that have heard the voice of God. Do we want to wake up at the second resurrection outside of Jasper walls? Or do we want to wake up when Christ comes in the clouds of glory or wake up when we hear the gospel? That the same voice that wakes us up now is the same voice that wakes up wakes us from our grave. And the book is delivered to one who is illiterate, saying, please read this. And he says, I'm not literate. It's a famine for the word of God. It's not a lack of Bibles. It's a famine from hearing the spirit and pulling the Bible together and speaking and articulating the thoughts and the mind, and the intent and the purpose and the plans of God, the living God. The God that is getting ready for the end of this world and the return of Christ. Are we alert to this? Are we aware that this is what's going on? Are we aware that he's going to cleanse and judge his house? Verse 13 says, then the Lord said, inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, same condition as the time of Christ. The same hardness of heart. The same institutionalism. The same scholarly presumption, the same credentialism. Well, does he authorize? How dare he? How dare he tell us smooth things? We're the authoritarians. We tell you what to do. Commandments of men, the doctrines of men, traditions of men, churchianity, religiosity. But have removed their hearts far from me and their fear towards me is taught by the commandments of men. We're too busy afraid of what the church is going to think. What is my pastor going to think? What is the whatever? What is the leadership going to think? Be worried about what God thinks. Be worried about the voice of God. 
to your soul, to your life, to your heart. Fear of men. But what does the bylaws of my church say? What does the creed say? The living God and his word. Do you know why you're being convicted? Because it's his word I'm teaching. Verse 14 says, therefore begin, behold, excuse me, and I will again do a marvelous work amongst his people. How? Through breaking of this weird shell. He needs brokenness. He needs people seeking him. He needs repentance. We, he, we need our hearts pricked. A marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Christ prayed that prayer. Father, thank you that you've hidden them from the wise and from the prudent. Why? Because I'm meek and humble and lowly of heart. And only those who see me in meekness, in humility, will yoke up with me. That I'll open up the revelation of the kingdom of God to the meek and to the lowly and the humble of heart. Who remained when Babylon came and took over? Who did they let remain? Who remained? The poor. The humble. So they could be as farmers and vine dressers. Did you know that's what we're going to be in the kingdom of God? Don't you know that's what Adam was? Don't you know what that, that's what Christ was? When Mary had went to the garden and says, hey, gardener, vine dresser, where's my Jesus? And he says, Mary, Mary. Come on now. I'm the second Adam. Don't you recognize that I'm the gardener, that God is humble, meek and lowly of heart? Woe, woe to us for we're blind and deaf and dumb. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And they say, who sees us and who knows us? Why do we think that we could pull the wool over our own eyes and then we could trick God into being as self-deceived as we are? It doesn't work. The ostrich with the head in the sand program doesn't work. Shalom. May God's peace be our peace. Not the peace of our flesh, not the peace of this world. So we hide, says right here, seek deep to hide their counsel far from the Lord and their works are in the dark. And then they say, who sees us and who can know us? This is the weirdness of the games we play. We actually don't fear God because if we did, we would understand that he is. There's three persons in the Godhead, by the way. One of them is the Holy Spirit. And he is everywhere all the time. There is nowhere you can go to hide from God, the Holy Spirit. And all of that is brought to Christ who is mediating in our stead. And God knows who has a hold of his garments and who doesn't who's just down here playing sanctimonious religious games, using God's name as we're hijacking his name for our purposes. God the Father is watching all of this. Who can see us? Who can know? Surely, verse 16, you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed, esteemed as the clay? Do we make God equal with ourselves? Don't we know that he's made everything for his purpose? For shall the same, excuse me, for shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me? How completely disattached are we from the reality that God knows our thoughts, our intent, knows why we were made, and knows where the malfunction has gone wrong and where we are totally twisted in our processing? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? How Deeper in the twistedness of our iniquity have we gone that we actually believe that somehow we could dance and prance and put on our weird show and somehow God doesn't get it. God's fooled. God's drawn away by our narratives. God's sucked into our intoxicated reasoning or lack of reasoning process. That God does not remain in total infinite sobriety. 
that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He sits in infinite wisdom. He has never not been infinitely wise. This is not God with a learning curve. God's not learning anything from you or me. God's not gaining wisdom from us. Where's our humility? Verse 19 says, the humble also also shall increase their joy in the Lord and the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. Why? Because they'll have the revelation of God. They will see the meek and humble lowliness of the infinite, all-powerful and wise God that God has always been meek and lowly and humble. Satan is not. Satan is a tink, twinkle toe parader. Satan is the one who says, look at me. Satan is the one saying, what about me? What about me? What about me? Satan is the one that is saying, pay attention to me. I need attention right now. Satan is the one that has to take over every conversation. This is the one where Satan has always got to be the center of attention all the time. And he sees himself as highly needy. And everyone's got to cater to his need, his ego, his perception, his narrative that he's trying to keep propped up and stoked all the time because it's an ever dying fire. This narcissism that we have normalized in Christianity is absolutely an offense to God. Do you know who was satisfied of God? Let's read it again. The humble shall increase their joy in the Lord. The poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel because we don't see ourselves out of our pay grade. We stay in our lane. We're content with a good God that identifies with us and, and sympathizes with our needs. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob shall not now be ashamed, nor shall his face now grow pale. As we realize that the very one that we're at war with is the one that has redeemed us and has taken our burden and our iniquity upon himself, has bore them, and has offered his righteousness to those who are humble enough to receive it. But when he sees his children, the work of my hands in the midst, they will hollow my name and hollow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. That's all God wants. We've lost our fear because we're so inebriated. We're so intoxicated with our own self-glory. These also who err in spirit will come to understanding like the book of Daniel is obsessed with. Understand. We don't understand. God says, I want to open up your eyes and open up your mind so you do understand, so you have wisdom. And those who complained shall learn doctrine, not the doctrine of arrogance, not the doctrine of presumption, the doctrine, the mind of God, the heart of God the purposes of God, the mentality of God, the ways of God, the kingdom of God and how he pulls everything together in an ultimate coordination where it is for the good of everyone else. But his humility is the wisdom. Meekness is the spirit in which all things will work together for good. And play into a beautiful symphony, which is the kingdom of God. But this whole shooting out to be the superstar and I have to have supreme attention in which, unfortunately, this is the spirit of our times. How many likes, how many subs, how much attention I can get. People committing suicide over this, going crazy over this, anything for attention. And Satan is stoking this madness. So let's see. I think I'll talk about one more thing. We'll end it. We'll end it here. Jeremiah 52. Is that okay? So we'll part three it right here. Might even do it before that. Just let's see here. Yeah, I might just do. Second Kings 24. And before I do that, let me just talk for a little bit. This is still teaching on the bread and the year-day principle of Ezekiel 4. 
But all he's saying is, I want you to know that this is all coming from Leviticus 25, where God says, if my people err, if my people turn their back on me, if my people will harden their heart and defy me, like Nadab and Abihu, I will take the Day of Atonement and create a desolation that will cleanse and purge my people and draw from that a remnant. The Day of Atonement is to create a people ready to face God unveiled, like on the Day of Atonement. And the Day of Atonement was inaugurated because of the strange fire and the rebellion that completely was a recapitulation, a redo of what Satan did up in heaven. And God says, we have absolutely come back to ground zero. We're already on, we've got nowhere with this. The Day of Atonement was to show what God's going to have to do to restore his people to himself, and he's going to have to break them of their self-sufficiency. That's why it's a high Sabbath. The Sabbath is emphasized because it is no works or you will be vomited out of the land. Your your name will be taken from the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll be removed from the registry of Jerusalem. God is very severe about no works will achieve to your citizenship on the Day of Atonement. It is a very huge showcase of imputed righteousness the works of somebody else, the merits of somebody else, the blood and redemption, the atonement of somebody else is the star of the show, is the centerpiece of the Day of Atonement. If God is going to bring his people back and they come back meek and humble and lowly and restored and trusting, it's a Sabbath. And the means of doing that, a big emphasis, go back to Leviticus chapter 16 and Leviticus 23. It's the affliction. It's the word ana. I keep using that word ana. It's where you get hanak or hanukkah to devote, to dedicate. But it's the word to afflict, to press an oppression down on someone where it's pushing them down, but it forces them to look up. It's what God did to Nebuchadnezzar when he afflicted him and sent him out to the field. And the dew of heaven was upon his back, and he looked like John the Baptist out there. He looked like Esau. He looked like Cain. And he had to come to himself. We have to see ourselves for the desperate sinners that we really are. That's what happened when the Holy Spirit was upon the disciples from the day of Pentecost on, where people realized that they were guilty of the sin of crucifying God in the flesh. That is about as Cain as you can get. That is the blood of Zechariah crying out, saying, you don't want to hear my voice. You don't see the true hideousness of your nature. You don't see how dangerous you are. You don't see that you're a bona fide, God-killing machine. And that is the beginning of our restoration, is owning the fact of the sobriety of the prodigal son is he came to himself and says, I am a squanderer. I was given riches. I'm Lucifer. If Satan had gotten the kingdom of heaven in his hands, he would bring it to nothing. It would be consumed in his cosmic narcissism. It would be brought to desolation. Satan can't win this war. It will be nothing but fodder for his insatiable appetite. Just like every narcissist does, they bring everything to destruction and desolation. Satan can't win. You can't win. Our selfishness cannot win. Our satanic mind can't win. The mind of Cain, the mind of Esau, the beast mind, the ravaging mind can't win. We can't deify this stuff. We can't set it up as a model for us. we got to forget about this Machiavellian mentality in which we think we should go out as these the, the prowess of an animal to go out and to seize our prey mentality. God saying, you need my heart. You need my mind. I am meek and mild and lowly of heart. I look out for your needs. I take my resources. I consider not my own well-being, my own reputation. 
I seek your well-being above all things. That's my mind, Philippians chapter 2. That's the mind that I have. That's the mind I'm trying to reveal to you. If I have to cast a weight upon you to force you to look up so you could see my glory and so you could cry out to me and I could deliver you, then that's what I'm going to do. If I have to place you into the horrible pit, into the miry clay of Psalms chapter 40, in which you cry out to me, I will deliver you. I will take you out of the pet pit. I will set your feet upon a high ground, and you will sing a new song to me. You will see my goodness, God says. You'll see my tenderness, my care for you. Why are you trusting yourself? Why are you trusting in your selfishness? Why are you trusting in the mind of Satan? Why are you trusting in the narcissism and the insatiability of it? It will never serve you. It's temporary. Learn the doctrine. The truth as it is in Christ. You want the mind of Christ? See these things. Forget about being some little yogi bodhisattva and what you think. You're just going to meditate on these little high synthetic things and you're going to spiral up to the mind of Christ. You've got to see the full spectrum. Start reading from Genesis to Revelation. And if you don't want to do it chronologically, fine. But dig into all this other stuff we're talking about. Because I know for a fact that these are not the highlighted parts of the Bible that I'm teaching on. I'm teaching on the wild wilderness of things not being taught. Not just tracking over our favorite verses that fulfill our little story time bed narr narratives that put us to sleep at night. The spiritual binky. Minky, gummy, deep, I know. For your Bible, build me slow. You guys, there's so much growth. There is so much to understand. There's so much meat. There's so much maturing. There's so much that the latter rain is going to have to fill in the blanks and come out of our infancy. We're going to have to see the sinfulness of our nature. We're going to have to allow God to take us through these afflictions for a disenchantment to unpack all of these narratives that we've somehow interlaced into our being and we trust in, and they're so part of our subconscious that we don't understand that we have a false image of God in our minds. And God's got to unpack this stuff. He's got to unravel this stuff. He's got to cut the threads and pull these threads out and let these things all unravel, and then we're not allowed to freak out. We have to realize that God is dissecting us because we have a cancer that has metastasized in every fiber of our being. We're going to have to come to a revelation of ourselves and a revelation of God's redeeming, merciful, infinite, sacrificial atonement that cost him everything and was an infinite pain upon his divine soul. And we're going to have to repent on that basis. We're going to have to see the horrors of sin in a way that we've never seen it before. For our own sake, as a safety from indulging in sin in the minimizing of it and of the strange way that we whitewash these prophet killing tombs all prophet killing was you guys was just not wanting to hear the voice of god not wanting god to tell us what's true instructing and telling god saying i won't listen to you until you deliver it in this way in this tone in this manner you have to prepare this little snacky snack of how you talk to me like the most perfect little cakes of the queens of heaven. That's us. We're the, we're the queen of heaven, just like in the Old Testament, how they would prepare the cakes exactly right for the queen of heaven, which is who? Us. We're the little queens. We're the little princesses. We're the little princes. Just go through, read through the Lamentations. The noble and the beautiful and the and the precious and the delicate are all brought to this horror show. So we can really understand the nature of sin. And quit gussying it up. Quit dressing it up. Quit decorating it up. Quit rebranding it with new acceptable narratives. Stop it. You can put a wig and lipstick on that werewolf all you not want, but when the moon comes out, it's going to tear you to pieces. 
Sin is sin is sin. Selfishness and self-glory is a werewolf. We have dressed up in wig and high heels and we're all dancing to it. We're giving it a 10. Throwing gold glitter on it. Hitting the golden buzzer. God says, what are you doing? This is what ruined my kingdom. This is what created an emergency in all of my cosmic, beautiful paradise. And I had to hit the brakes. The entire cosmic universe is staring on hold for this thing to be finished. God is obsessed with nothing else other than dealing with this. And he is soon to wrap it up. That's what I'm trying to tell you. He is truly soon to wrap it up. And God's people aren't even ready because they don't want to venture out into other parts of Scripture. It's a wilderness to them. And they're going to be completely baffled when God starts managing and handling his people. And they're going to be abysmally um, unaware. They're not going to know because the word of God has been absolutely a sealed book to them because they haven't ventured past their little tiny nursery narratives. They haven't taken in the full counsel of God. They haven't seen the full balances. They haven't seen the mature view where all things are working together, where that's all love. God bringing his people desolation is God's love. Because he wants to disenchant us with the very thing that's going to cause us an eternal desolation. Better now than then. Whatever he's got to do now prior to the second resurrection, do you know what I say? God, if you love us, you'll do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Even if we're kicking and screaming, dear Lord, whatever it takes to prevent us from being in the second resurrection, God, please bring me either in the first resurrection or to be alive and remaining when you come the clouds of glory. But I want to go into the gates of the new Jerusalem. Dear God, whatever you got to do in your love, you do it. Even if I'm kicking and screaming. All this ministry is trying to do is to venture out into these other truths so you're not discouraged, so you're not despondent, so you don't give up hope, so you understand that the hand of God is in this. It's just his strange work. He's got to manage this thing. Satan has got to march on us. He's he's ahead of the game. He's figured out our psychology. He's already worked out all the details. He knows how to play us. He knows how to pimp us. He knows how to create our our buffoonery. The silliness, the recklessness. All with these rose-colored glasses on. And we're listening to leadership that is redirecting you into buying into this gosh golly ice cream candy-coated, saccharine, weird sweetness that the Pharisees were, that Satan is. What does God have to do to disenchant us from lies, from great delusion, from intoxicating narratives, from a spiritual inebriation that has gripped us in our delusion and our false sense of our deity? First, Satan said that you are immortal gods. And we found a way to weave this into Christianity. Reality is, you guys, that we are made of the dust of the ground. And God's got to bring us to the dust of the ground. God's got to humble his people to remind them that our lives can be just absolutely snuffed out in a flash. I got to work search and rescue in the Navy. I got to deal with severe mental health uh, uh, counseling in in crises mode all the time after I got out of the Navy. I got to, before the Navy, deal with the very extreme situations around the whole biker scene and the whole weird gangster scene. And we lived poor. We're around all this violence, death. I am the only person in my family who is alive other than a brother who's in prison. That's it. That's it. 
what am I trying to tell you? I am very aware as to how easy life can be snuffed out. And Satan has pulled the wool over our eyes in this false immortality. How indestructible we are, how falsely permanent things are. Not so. Not so. The truth of the scripture is this. God alone is holy. God alone is righteousness and life and eternity. He alone bears that reality upon himself. We are all but passing, and we only have permanence and eternity as we do in our identity in the one person who is eternal Christ. And that is called reckoning. That is called imputation. That is God saying that I will let Christ be your identity for you. All of this chasing of identity, the obsession with it, why do you think Lucifer is stoking that? Because we are chasing a phantom, phantom identity. People don't call themselves Christians first. You know what they call themselves? I'm a black Christian. I'm a conservative Christian. I'm a gay Christian. Unbelievable. Either you're a Christian hid in Christ or you're not. And all this pre-stuff is pure demonic fantasy. Your identity is in Christ, period, or you don't have life, period. When is someone going to tell you that? Identity plus Christ? Unbelievable deception. Delusion. Chasing of vain genealogies, etc., etc. Unbelievable. You are in Christ, and that is your identity. Faith in him, holding on to the hem of his garment, saying, look not upon me, but look upon him who is the truth of righteousness and eternity. Look not to me, God. I plead with you to not look at me. God hears that prayer. But validate me according to all this other stuff I'm wallowing in and my false identity. And we're buying into that narrative. Do you know what it is? To your peril, to your doom, to your destruction. This is the type of false narrative that's out there. Just driving us towards great delusion. Very enchanted. Vain philosophies. And is here now. So I'm not going to go further in the study. Uh, I'll part three this uh, from here. I think we need to think upon these things. If God is going to bring his people through what we're going to go into part three. Yeah, the siege is coming. The punishment is coming to those who have had the greatest light. Nobody's had more light than, as far as I'm concerned, American Protestants who are given freedom and expression of religion, having free access, and then we have sold ourselves out to very Romanish deceptions, very New Age, very pagan. We're now of the world. In fact, I believe we fulfilled the image of the beast at 100%. I believe we'll be judged for that. I believe there will be people that have had great light that will be completely given over to the mind and the purposes of Satan and be given great enthusiastic power. And there will be those that will hear the gospel and that will be meek and lowly and humble and that they will trust Christ in a great loud cry that will come to this world. I believe Christ is coming soon. I believe the things I'm talking about will be sudden and soon. I'm not giving a time. I don't know the time. I think we are in the signs of the times. I don't think we are in any kind of a calendar process. I think that was already over. I think it's not according to calendar dates. I think that we have to look for the signs of the times. And I believe the everlasting gospel and the great loud cry going to God's people, speaking of his judgment to the temple of God to the people of God, to those that keep the commandments of God, to those that are violating the commandments of God, to those who call themselves by his name. This message is the cry to his people. This is the beginning of the judgment of the house of God. And we could accept it or we could reject it. We could do whatever we're going to do with it. To reject it is to our own peril. To accept it is life eternal. Harden not your heart. All the prophets spoke this way. You can't tell me, well, that's not a very loving tone. 
Well, then the prophets were not filled with the spirit of Jesus. The mind of Jesus was not in the prophets. First Peter says that it was the spirit of Jesus speaking through those prophets, crying and pleading and just appealing and begging them. Do you know why I'm doing this? Do you know what spirit is animating me? Not the spirit of judging people. I don't compare myself to anybody. I'm probably the worst offender. I'm probably the as sinful as you can get. I know that for a fact. That's why I don't have any enchanted pretext of this stuff upon myself. But do you know what the reality is of why I cry out? Because honestly, I really believe that the same spirit that was upon these prophets, the same spirit animates my heart. I think Christ is crying out. I think he doesn't want you to burn. I think he doesn't want you to be destroyed. I think he wants you to understand the urgency in which he doesn't want you in the second resurrection. That he wants the spirit to wake you up and say, how do I avail myself of the merits that I need to stand before God? And he says, my son, my son, my son, listen to him. I'm well pleased with him. How much lower can God give us access how much more can he dwell in the valley? How much more can he be amongst the lilies in the valley? How much more can he reach down to the valley of death and to the valley of the sons of Hinnon and reach down to us poor lowly souls that are wallowing in our ignorance and pride and arrogance and presumption to our own doom, trying to, to wake us up, to hear the truth about ourselves, but to not be overwhelmed when we finally get a revelation of ourselves. Poor, miserable, blind, wretched, naked. Body of death. Can't waste to, wait to cast off this tent to receive my immortal, eternal tent at the return of Christ. Sinful men, I'm carnal, sold under sin. The work of the Holy Spirit has got to penetrate our hearts, you guys. We've got to turn towards Christ as our only hope. This is exactly how God can lay a hold of us as if we lay hold of Christ. How is this not love? How much more love can God have for you and me? To offer his only begotten eternal, Christ is now the son of man, representing man in heaven. So he presents the great hope of all men. Everything that men have cried out for that have wanted to get right with God is all embodied in Christ. You have it in Christ. God has mercy. It's been poured out in Christ. God has grace. It's all poured out in Christ. He's your canopy. He's your covering. He's the tent that can dwell with God. Abide and hide and reside in Christ. Trust in Christ. Talk to Christ. Commune with Christ. This is it. This is the only call we have. I know this was supposed to be a study about Ezekiel's bread. But the bread is the bread that nobody wanted to accept when Christ says, are you going to reject me? You're going to walk away from me? You don't want to eat of this bread of humility? You want to confess the sinfulness of your Cain nature, your Esau nature? You want to wrestle with this? You don't want to enter into Jacob's wrestling. You don't want to enter into the Romans 7 wrestling in which I'm exposing and de uh, intoxic well, what I'm uh, detoxing you. God's removing the, the drugs that are affecting our, our mind. He's giving us the spirit of sobriety. He's waking us up to the reality of our danger. And he's offering Christ who's already made peace with God. Our peace has been satisfied with Christ. And then the emblems of that peace are the nails in his hands. Wrath exhausted, justice exhausted in one man. And I'm presenting this man to you. How is this not love? This is love. This is eternal love. This is love that is beyond comprehension. You're gonna have to spend eternity to literally break this down. God cannot explain how much love was poured out in Christ. You're going to have to enter into the gates into eternity and come under discipline and the doctrine of Christ and be taught throughout eternity for ever expanding views and capacities to drink in the love of God that's poured out in Christ. I cannot possibly explain it. I don't even have it. I'm still looking through a glass darkly myself. 
I'm only animated by the spirit that's saying it's so important. Nothing in this world is worth it. It's all passing. This will continue to be the doctrine. There is no other doctrine. This world passing desolate powder. Christ is substance, eternity, life, beauty, everything that you want to experience throughout eternity is embodied in Christ and it will be imparted to his saints. Nothing in this life and all of its fakeness and all of its delusions and you can't have both. If you're being told that you can love both God and mammon, you are being sold a bill of goods. You're being lied to. No, single-eyed, single-minded, completely given over. That we brought out in the next study very strongly. Cast yourself upon Christ. Don't trust and say, well, I could have part-time the mind of Satan as long as it serves me, and then part-time the mind of Christ so I could have my insurance policy to get to heaven. I'm telling you, that is the beginning of lies. That is the double mind that Satan had. That's the beginning of, of schizophrenia, of spiritual schizophrenia. The split mind is what schizophrenia means. The mind split. Don't trust in that. When God's bringing us to singleness of mind, of humility, and driving us into this manna experience, don't be thinking about Egypt. Don't be thinking about your glory. Trust. Trust in the bread of humility. Trust in the fact that when God even shows you the horrors of yourself, it's only to disenchant you of any false glamour that we might have in our head that's going to destroy us in the end. The same glamour that Satan has that's going to destroy him. God loves you and loves me to present the sobering message of the gospel. The gospel is a light. It breaks the shackles. It breaks the bondage. It breaks the, 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 the slaves free from these mental narratives in which we're trusting in. As long as you're under the gospel, you're free. As long as you're under these truths, you're free. But the second you start sliding back in the darkness, you're going to see that it will be in contradiction to everything that I'm sharing with you in these presentations. All right, guys, pray for one another. Pray for me. Thanks for being a part of this study. And keep me in prayer. My health is one thing. Spiritual battles is another. And uh, we're definitely entering into these last times that I want to be God's servant all the way up until the end. And uh, in the end, not be a hypocrite. In the end, really be like his servant and to uh, enter to the gates with you all. And that we all walk through and we all sit at the table together and Jesus walks in. And we cast our crowns at his feet.